I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I am uh, leading this uh, Meet the Experts panel for film documentary filmmakers. And we are speaking with Ryan White, the director of Goodnight Oppie, Sasha Jenkins, the director of Louis Armstrong Black and Blues, uh, Isabel Castro, director of Miha, and Matthew Heineman, director of Retrograde. The first question, and I love asking this question of documentary filmmakers, is um, what was what was the uh, film that mo that you saw and you said to yourself, yeah, I want to do that. I want to tell these real stories. And um, Isabel, I want to start with you on that one. What was uh, what were what what was one of or some of those films that made that impact on you? Oh, for me, it was Paris is Burning. I um, I. So I wanted, I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a photojournalist. I wanted to do conflict photojournalism. And I interned at the New York Times in college. And um, I just got kind of spooked. <laughs> like, it was just like, you know, really low pay, um, you know, really traumatizing um, experiences. And, um, and when I saw Paris is Burning, I was just, I was so like fundamentally changed as a person that I realized that there were stories that I could do um, like, you know, within um, just a few blocks away. Like I just, I realized that there were stories all around me that um, that were hugely impactful and it just, Paris is burning. Um, it was so beautifully shot. I mean, the aesthetics of it just like really, influenced me and made me realize the beauty of documentary cinematography like I just I was totally mesmerized I mean I saw it so many times and um I, I all of my work aspires to reach that level of influence uh, what about you Sasha well my dad was a documentary filmmaker so I kind of grew up uh seeing the power of documentary film and journalism through cameras uh he made lots of different documentaries. Uh, one particular one was about the pyramids in Sudan, which um, most people don't know much about. There are more pyramids in Sudan than there are in Egypt. Um, but uh, he also made a documentary for a show called 30 Minutes, which was the kids version of 60 Minutes in the 80s. It was a whole expose on fast food restaurants. And I remember loving McDonald's as a kid and then learning that uh, people were being exploited. So it was confusing for me, but I felt that was uh, something that I could relate to because I liked hamburgers as a kid and uh, saw a way through it there. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Matthew? Um, I mean, I had no idea I wanted to be a filmmaker. I was a, I studied history in college. I got rejected from Teach for America and sort of stumbled into film. Um, so I, I can't say like, you know, I, I had a lot of big influences growing up per se. I think as I got into film, I remember seeing Murder Ball, um, a documentary about paraplegic rugby players, and just realizing that that documentaries could be more than the sort of history documentaries that I watched in school. And there could be, you know, three acts, and there could be antagonists and protagonists, and there could be characters that are as interesting, if not more interesting, than you know, movie stars and. And that got me really excited about the potential of this form. And, you know, certainly as, as I progressed in my career, tried to continue to push to make docs feel as, as exciting and interesting as narrative films. So I think that that film really had a profound impact on me. I cannot tell you how happy that answer made me because Murder Ball is one of my all time favorite documentaries. It is so good. Um, and I feel like not enough people remember that. Um, <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Uh, like Isabel, I thought I was going to be a photographer. That's what I did like all through high school. I loved darkroom photography. When I went to college, I was hoping that I would be a photographer. And But I was always like a film nerd growing up, like loved film. But I grew up in Georgia, like documentary film. My parents were not documentary filmmakers, far from it. Like I didn't even know that that was a medium that you could do. And I will never forget it because I was such a nerd. I like was taking a film class and I had like a, a B plus and I wanted an A in that class. And for extra credit, you could go to this screening and it was an Agnes Varda film. I will not do the French title, but it's The Gleaners and I. Um, and I remember like sitting in the movie theater and there were only like five of us in, in the back 
um, and watching the film and my mind being totally blown. Like, what the fuck is she doing right now? Like, she's like talking to us and she's there's like footage of her in the car. as She's driving along. And like, I remember coming out of that movie theater being not even knowing what a documentary film was and saying like, whatever she was doing, I want to do something like that. And, you know, I still like to shoot a lot myself. And I think documentary filmmaking is one of the few um, careers where you can still do that yourself. And so I'll, 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 I think it's very easy to, for me to pinpoint that moment in a movie theater. Uh, switching gears a little bit, um, uh, we've heard. I, I've, I've asked about. I've asked about what inspired you, and I'm curious as to um, what have you been watching um, lately, uh, and and the, the documentaries, the current documentaries that have uh, um, struck a chord with you over the last couple of years. And I'm just wondering which ones uh, have there been uh, that have done that. Uh, Sacha, I wanted to start with you on that. You know, that's a tough question. Um... I don't always find inspiration in documentary films. I actually find inspiration sometimes in narrative films. Believe it or not, the Planet of the Apes, uh, the first Planet of the Apes, which I believe it or not, I go back to. And as a kid, I loved, I wanted to be an astronaut, fascinated by time travel. And in the first Planet of the Apes, you know, these astronauts, they blast off and they wind up coming back to Earth. They don't realize it's Earth in the future. And it's actually a black astronaut with them, with Charlton Heston. And so the group splits up and you don't see the black astronaut for a while. And then when you see him again, there's a, uh, a zoo where, first of all, there weren't many, if any, black, because the humans in the film were savages and they didn't speak. So obviously Charlton Heston and the black astronaut actually spoke. But the next time you saw the black astronaut was in this zoo and he was taxidermied. And for me, it speaks to documentary from, from, from my perspective, the kinds of films that I want to make and the things that I want to say and the things that I want to unpack. That was pretty sub subversive. And I guess Rod Sterling was one of the writers on the first Planet of the Apes. And he was a really subversive guy who liked to sort of use popular culture as a way to say things. And so for me, any opportunity to watch something that gives you the opportunity to say something and say something that is um, germane to your identity or something you really uh, care about, um, I draw inspiration from. Well, uh, the, um, uh, now that, that I, I guess I don't have to see the movie now because the ending's been spoiled for me, but um, uh, uh, Matthew, what about you? I'm going to cheat and just say the film, the last film I saw, which was uh, Andy Timoner's film, uh, Last Flight Home just completely broke me open um it's about her um her father's decision to uh die on his own will um he, he was terminally ill and it's it's it sort of documents the final last two weeks of his life and it just i don't know in some ways it was the most life-affirming film i think i may have ever seen it, it was so beautiful i think it's something that we as westerners and especially Americans don't think about a lot. Um, we sort of push away death and don't talk about death and often put our, you know, other generations into homes. And 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 I just the the profound nature of of how open her family was with with death and the beauty and, and lessons they learned from from her father in those final moments. Um, it truly just broke me open. Um, and yeah, I really, it was a beautiful, beautiful film, so. No, I did, I just saw Last Flight Home as well. It's the last, it's the last stock I saw, which I thought was incredible. Uh, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard in this season to like see a lot of documentaries because you're constantly on the road and like so many of the filmmakers are, are, are good friends of mine um, and you try to catch them when you can, but I try to see, as many at film festivals or on the big screen as I can. But one one I watched recently um, that I really loved, just because like I still like to feel that I'm young, but then I watch a young filmmaker make something and it's it's totally different. It was um, I think you I think I don't know how to pronounce his last name, David Siv, I think he made he made bad acts. Matt and I were just on a a panel with him a few days ago, and it's like 
Totally. It reminded me of what it's like to make a film when I was in college where it's like all DIY, shoot it yourself, edit yourself. It's about his family. It's very first person, which I've never done, which would be terribly boring if I did. Uh, but I loved watching like a 20 something year old filmmaker who had very little resources and made something really simple and it's a small film i use that with quotation marks but it's so gorgeous and and resonant i think um and so it was fun to watch something that just got noticed purely because it's a good story and good artistry and uh isabel uh what about you yeah i mean uh it's such a conundrum when you're a doc filmmaker and you're um <laughs> you don't have a lot of time to watch other films. I also like admittedly don't watch a lot of other films because then I get really jealous and it's a terror. <laughs> I get like really jealous because everyone's so talented. I get overwhelmed. So, um, you know, similar to Sasha, I watch a lot of fiction films. Um, uh, that said, uh, Reed Davenport's I Didn't See You There um, that premiered at Sundance um was really affecting for me um it, it was just a beautiful personal film it like really had a voice it just um it, it's a film that like has stayed with me you know it's like you watch a lot of films and they're beautiful but there are some that just kind of stay in your mind and you think about um on a daily basis and that's one of them um it's really kind of changed my perspective on um on how accessible uh or rather inaccessible the world is um and so um that was the last documentary that like really kind of stuck with me well um uh ryan sasha isabel and matthew uh, thank you so much for joining us on this panel we wish you all the best over this upcoming season